Hello, mainland America. From the studios of KGU in Honolulu, the NBC station in Hawaii, we're about to bring you interviews with American refugees from the war zone of China. They arrived in Honolulu this afternoon, two short hours ago, aboard the steamship President Taft, and will continue on their mainland voyage tomorrow morning. This is the first American soil they've touched since leaving war zone China. First now, I'd like to introduce to you Mr. Henry Lilly of Davidson, North Carolina. Mr. Lilly, what were you doing in China? Well, I'd planned to see Central China and get out before any trouble started in that area. I see, and you didn't quite make it, is that right? Didn't quite make it. Well, uh, why uh, were you in China when you knew it was dangerous, Mr. Lilly? Well, I felt that I could get down to Shanghai and see some of Central China, see Hangzhou and one or two other towns, and then leave in plenty of time. Uh Uh-huh. Well, uh, tell us about when you got back to Shanghai, Mr. Lilly. Well, I left on the 12th, the early morning 12th, to see Hangzhou and returned to Shanghai on the night of Friday the 13th. All the lights were placed, uh, put out on our train, and there was sharp fighting in the Hongqiu district of Shanghai. Our train was switched over to the South Station. Mm -hmm. And uh, did they have any accommodations for you in Shanghai? No. When we got off at the South Station, we were told we had to sleep in the streets. Were you forced to do this? No. I was able to get, finally, to the French concession. The militiamen of the Chinese forces there was very kind and allowed us to go through the first pickets in order, as he said that we might sleep in an American mission concession nearby. But could you get in the mission settlement? No. When we got into the district of the mission settlement, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning, and there were no answers given at all. So with our coolies, we went through about seven picket lines through various sections of the city until we got over in the French concession. Uh And uh, where did you go from there, Mr. Lilly? Well... On Saturday morning, I went back to the Broadway mansions where my baggage and washing was because I wished to get those before leaving Shanghai. You got your baggage and washing? Well, I got my baggage all right, but my washing is still at the Broadway mansions. I see. Well, were you near any of the really bad bombing, Mr. Lilly? Well, when I was at the Broadway mansions about 10.15 on Saturday morning, a bomb from a Chinese plane, which was intended for the Japanese uh, concession and also for the Izuma flagship, hit about 400 yards from the Broadway mansions. And uh, you're mighty glad to be back on American soil? Yes, I'm glad to be back. Well, thank you, Mr. Davidson. And we have here Mrs. Carter. Mrs. Carter, where were you when the trouble started? I was in the French concession. Well, what actually happened according to your version? The first explosion was a bomb which landed off up the Rangpu River. We could hear it very well. About what time was that? 4 to 4.30 p.m. Friday, August 13th. Well, uh, how about it after that, after 4.30? All was quiet from 11. They continued shooting off and on until 11 p.m. Friday night to 2.30 a.m. Saturday morning was quiet. Then it started in again. We could hear the machine guns and bombs as well. Saturday, August the 14th, at approximately 4, 4.30, the bomb was dropped on Nanking Road. Approximately 100 were killed, many injured. Damaged both hotels, a palace and cafe. Bombing of the Nanking Theater at Avenue Joffrey and Edward the Seventh Avenue uh, the same afternoon, killing many. I don't remember the number. And uh, this was approximately six to eight of our blocks from where I was living at the time. And um, you could hear them most of the Saturday night, I suppose. Oh yes, all night Saturday night, almost continual firing. And uh, Sunday was mostly quiet due to rain, I suppose. Airplanes were flying continually. We saw the airplanes many times, and on Sunday did not watch because of the orders to keep indoor when... Keep indoor. Well, uh, when did you decide to leave? It was between 5 and 6 p.m. Sunday before I was certain that I could get on the Taft. 
Well, what about the trip down to the tender? Well, there was no... Due to the fact there was no buses and no street cars, we could only take a chance on taxis and rickshaws. I called 6 o'clock for my taxi, and they said they'd send one right away. And I was very glad to see this taxi coming, and I was down. It took me... About five five minutes to... Five to eight minutes in the taxi down to the uh, dock, the customs jetties. Well, did you see anything of the actual war there? I, I passed the and saw the hole where the bomb was dropped in the Anthem Theater. I should say it was big enough to put about two automobiles in it. Well, you had a quiet trip then to the dock? Yes, it was quiet on down. Well, when did you arrive at the dock? About 20 minutes after 6th. And uh, did was there any uh, shooting around there at that time? There was no shooting at that time, but the airplanes were sailing around. It did not shoot the net near the tender until about 7.45. Well, you could, you could hear the uh, bullets at that time, I suppose. The airplane. Well, uh, what uh, time... How did you know exactly what time? You were giving us exact time. How do you know what time it was? Because it was a city clock on the... Uh, the bond that I was had been watching because I was very anxious to know when the tender was leaving. Well, then what happened? Well, about just approximately a quarter of eight when they began firing. And then after a quiet spell, we had another firing. And uh, we were all up on top on the tender. And when uh, at the time they were shooting, they would run us down below into the cabin. And it was so hot that we were glad to get back up and get some fresh air. And then came this third uh, salute, which I think they really, we thought was meant for us. And uh, we went down there, and, and just before going down this last time, though, the um, Navy guards arrived. And... Uh, what time did you actually leave then? We actually left at 8.45. We were held up 45 minutes. Well, did you see any war vessels? Yes. Uh, what the Japanese the gunboat. Well, uh, where was the Taft uh, in relation to the Bund? The Taft was um, about 20 miles out. Well, how long did it take you to get from the Bund out to the Taft? Approximately an hour. Well, did you uh, see any other vessels on the way over? Yes, we saw the flagship Augusta. And uh, on either side of it was um, a Japanese war vessel. Well, where are you going now? I am going home. I <laughs> hope to good old America. Well, can you describe your feelings when you saw uh, Honolulu this afternoon? I don't think there's any words that could possibly describe my feelings when I put my feet on the good old American soil. Thank you very much. And here is refugee Irving Levitus, who was also brought into the safety of Honolulu Harbor on the President Taft today. Mr. Levitus has been in China for the purpose of making a study and survey of Chinese nationalism and has been through a great deal of hostilities there. He's a professor of adult education. Mr. Levitus, how would you briefly describe the situation in the Orient? Well, I might say this, that if I haven't seen war in the Orient, I've seen something mighty like it. Well, where is your home, Mr. Levitus? I come from Kansas City, Missouri, so you can imagine what a peaceful atmosphere that is. Well, when did you receive your first baptism fire? Well, I really got into the hostilities in Tianjin, China. I had arrived there about the 25th of July, and on the evening of the 25th and the 26th, the Japanese attacked the Chinese city where I was living. I see. Then uh, I presume that you tried to find means of escaping the Chinese. Well, I called up the American consul as soon as the hostility started. The consul said he tried to get Marines to get me out, but Later, he returned the call and said the Marines couldn't get through. After that, I wasn't much worried about getting out because the whole YMCA was filled with refugees and there was first aid work to be done. You did escape from Tianjin, though, the Chinese city. Yes, after that. the council called me up the next day and said that since I couldn't be re rescued, why, the only thing I could do was to try to get out to myself. I did manage to cross the streets where the Japanese were in full possession and escaped across the river to the Italian concession. From then on, I went to the French and then the British concession and to presumable safety. I see. Well, did you, uh, excuse me asking this, but did you stop any of the bullets and shrapnel which might have been flying around? Well, when I got into the British concession, there was a general order that all able-bodied men who were capable of shouldering rifles report for duty and protect the settlement. 
I, of course, responded, and I was given the job of defending a small section in the British concession near the Chinese city. Chinese, uh, Bonan Dewey, and uh, Japanese were fighting in the vicinity. There were frequent attempts to come into the British concession. I had occasion to use my rifle a bit, and they returned the salute or courtesy, I guess you'd call it. And then you escaped to Shanghai. Well, yes, uh... I had to escape to Shanghai by a tug. The steamers were anchored off Tanku Harbor at the end of Heiho in the Yellow Sea, and I managed to get a tug to take me down the Heiho to Tanku. We were delayed there for a day because the Japanese were busy mopping up the territory, catching an arsenal. And uh, later I got on the steamer and got to Shanghai about August the 10th. Were you in the vicinity of Nanking Road when the bombs fell there? Well, I guess you can call it the vicinity. I was about 200 feet away. I was flung about 20 feet when the bomb fell. Well, uh, how long were you in shell-torn Shanghai before taking the emergency tender out to the President Taft? Well, from the 13th, 17th would be about four days, four hectic days where we were either dodging shrapnel or doing first aid work. I see. Well, did you manage to save any of your personal... Possessions? No, I didn't. I must confess that all I brought with me were a pair of pants and a shirt. <laughs> well, would you mind describing your boat ride? You mean on the tender? Yes. Well, we got on the tender and we were immediately herded downstairs. But before I got down, uh, an anti-aircraft gun started popping. And the first thing I knew was that there was a nice little gift from some plane resting about a couple of feet away from me. We got to the boat, though. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Levitus, for the story of your experience in China's war zones. I suppose it goes without saying that you're glad to be here and safe again. Thank you. And here we have Mr. Antibi, businessman from New York. Mr. Antibi was in Shanghai in charge of his firm's office where he was located for the past 18 months. His dealers were Chinese manufacturing firms. Now, Mr. Antibi, will you please tell us about how you came to the decision to get out of Shanghai. I was living in Shanghai Farm YMCA, and on the afternoon of Friday, the 13th of August, I came home and was just taking my usual shower bath when I heard a loud explosion. Followed by several other explosions, I wondered what it was and thought probably it was something in connection with the trouble that has been brewing between the Chinese and Japanese people. I looked out the window and saw clouds of smoke coming from the Chinese section of Shanghai. We did not hear any more explosions after dark. The next morning when I, when I awakened, I could hear airplanes overhead and decided it would be best not to go down to the office in the city. I could hear shooting in the distance all forenoon. By noon, everybody at the YMCA was worried sick with fear. We were surprised to see and hear bombs dropping inside the international settlement because we thought we were safe inside the international settlement. We were puzzled and could not understand. We stayed on through the afternoon at the YMCA, and by nighttime it was worse, bombs flaring, and the electric lights were out, and the people were all afraid to go out. I kept on worrying that what to do. I decided to, to try to go to the U.S. ship President Taft. I knew she was sailing Monday morning. I stayed up all night Saturday night trying to pack everything I had in one suitcase. I had my suitcase packed by noon Sunday and was nervous wrecked from the continuous explosions and the airplanes I could hear. Every Monday morning, I heard I hired a rickshaw coolie to take me to the wharf where the tug would take me out to the President Taft. When the coolie learned where I wanted to go, he refused to take me. I bribed him several times, the usual fare, and he took me. I boarded the tug, and while we were waiting for more passengers to come, the shooting started up again close to us, and several women fainted. The tug finally shoved off, and we got aboard the President Taft. Everybody felt relieved. We could see the Japanese fleet anchored inside the Wampu River. We sailed that afternoon, and I got my first sleep in three days. I slept for, for 24 hours, and I had all I had was my suitcase and five dollars and ten cents gold. No ticket, and I was worried sick of, of it all. The person was still worrying about my fare. I left my office just as it was closed on the 12th, and I hope it's still I hope it's still there. Well, Mr. Antibi, do you intend to go back to Shanghai? No, sir. Not until the shooting is all over. I'm glad I'm here on American territory. Thank you very kindly, Mr. Antibi. This program originated in KGU Studios in Honolulu, Hawaii. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Mm -hmm.